Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. I don't probably ought to turn to it, shouldn't I? Uh, I can quote it. Uh, you, you can quote this part of it. Be, and, and be not drunk with wine when there's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And I want to talk to you something about some, some things this morning that are, that are really, it's a great, a topic of great importance in the Scripture. And that is the issue of, 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 of God and the gods. God, big G, the God of the Bible, and God with a little g and an S on the end, the gods. That is the angelic creation. And it's important to understand that there is a supernatural creation in the world that's more than just the physical things that we deal with. And I, I pointed out to you before, when, you, when, you, when you're coming in this passage in Ephesians, he's going to start, he says to you in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, uh, not as fools, but as wise. We're to walk in wisdom. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We're to understand what God's will is. What, what is God doing today in the dispensation of grace? What's he doing in your life? What's he made you as a believer a part of? He immediately goes into verse 18, and be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, with, with the Spirit. And I've tried to, been trying to say to you, the first part of that verse is he's saying, don't go out there and all that paganism and, the, and, and the, the spiritual wickedness of the God of this world. And we talked about the wine of the fornication, mystery of Babylon, great and that kind of thing. And last week we talked about how that spiritual influence led to the fall of Adam and Eve, focused around the vine tree, which is the fruit of the vine. That's the connection between the wine and the spiritual connections with it. He gives you in verse 18, he says, he, he deals with those four institutions, and this is why, you know, I spent time studying those things and try to bring some of the stuff together for you. Right now, you're just getting the pieces. But these four institutions that God established for the orderly maintenance of, of mankind in order to bring order out of chaos that sin brings. Sin complicates life. God is a God of order, and the, the chaos that sin brought into creation, one was volition. So he says, you be filled with the Spirit. And when you are, this is what, what it's going to look like, verse, eight, verse 19 and 20. When the Spirit of God is in control of your life, when your life is under the control of the grace and, uh, of God revealed in His Word, your life is going to look like this. And that takes your personal volition to do it. Then it will move out into your marriage if you're married. Wives, husbands, that's marriage. That's the second institution, the foundational institution for the orderly maintenance of society. Then he talks about children and fathers, your family, if you have one. Here's how it works. Then he talks about masters and servants. That's the world, those four institutions. And then after he does all of that, he goes in chapter 6, verse number 10. And he says, finally, brethren, once you've got all that operating in your the prescribed social order for the believer and for the assembly, he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we, are, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You and I are in a spiritual battle. And he bookends the issue of the, the prescribed order of our lives, our individual choices to put our life under the control of God's Word, our, fa our, our, our marriages, our families, and our, our life in the world. He bookends the, 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 those institutions and, and our function in them with these issues of the spiritual conflict that we're a part of. So that issue of the, the, the spiritual battle, that we, we're not battling against flesh and blood, verse, chapter 6, verse 12 says, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's important for you to understand there is spiritual wickedness out there. There's a spiritual world out there that we battle against. And it's important to understand how that works. Come with me, if you will, to Deuteronomy. I'll talk with you a little bit about God, the God of the Bible, the God that created you, and the gods. Alex mentioned that uh, he, he had an encounter at the, at the fair with, with the, uh, the lady preacher. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. It's accepted today as the standard kind of a thing that, you know, you can have a woman preacher, a woman pastor, and so forth. Well, you know, the Bible doesn't say a woman can't preach, but it just says she can't pastor a church. To be the, pastor, the bishop of a local church, you have to be the husband of one, wi uh, uh, of one wife. In our culture today, maybe a lady could be the husband of one wife. <laughs> 
but not in the Bible. Okay? The responsibility for leadership in the local church is clearly uh, identified in a passage like that. Well, there's a spiritual warfare that's out there. And Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods. You see, big G, little g. He's the God of gods, the Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. I just want, I read that so you can understand, these creatures, these beings are real. They're as real as the God that created everybody is. So there's one head God, but then there are some other spirit beings, beings in the spiritual, in the spirit world, that are gods, that are rulers, that are lords. There's one Lord, and yet there's many lords. There's one God, big G. But then he has a lot of other creatures that are called gods, plural, with a little g. Come over to Exodus chapter 20. That's why in the Ten Commandments it starts out. You have to make a different differentiation, a distinction. Exodus chapter 20. God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, I am Jehovah thy Elohim, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There are other gods out there, but they're not your God, Israel. Your God is Jehovah God. He's the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's the top guy. All the other ones are subordinate. Some of them aren't good guys. Okay? All the gods, plural, aren't good. Come over with me to the book of Job. The book of Job, chapter 40. And here's, here's where you, gotta, you have to begin to be careful about this stuff. Job, chapter 4. Job, chapter 4. Verse number 18. Now, I'm going to look at a lot of verses with you this morning. You're just going to have to hang on and keep up, okay? I was, I was watching the video uh, in the sound room during the first session, and uh, Alice was talking about going fast. And I thought, man, that's not fast like we're going to go this time. <laughs> uh, he, 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 Alice is a, lot, is a lot smoother than I am about being fast. For, uh, Job chapter 4, verse 18. Behold, he that is God putteth no trust in his servants, and his angels he charges, charged with folly. Notice it's possible for the angelic realm, the spirits, the spirit creatures in the angelic realm, angels are spirits sent forth to minister. And angels can be charged with folly. Chapter 15, Job 15. By the way, Job's the first book in the Bible ever written. And it's clear in the book of Job that there's been a rebellion among the angelic host. Job 15, verse number 15. Job 15, 15. Behold, he putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. Why? Because there are some creatures that function in the heavens. There's some spiritual wickedness in high places. Come over with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 89. Fascinating passage, Psalm 89. Psalm 89 is, a, is an exposition of the covenant God made with Israel and with David. Psalm 89, verse 5. Psalm 89, verse 5. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Now you see the Lord there in all uppercase letters. That's Jehovah. Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence of all them that are about him. Now notice in the passage that what he's talking about when he talks about the faithful in the congregation of the saints, where is that congregation? Verse 6, who in heaven can be compared unto thee? Who among the sons of the mighty, that's the angelic host, can be likened unto thee. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. But where is that assembly of the saints? 
That's not on the earth. That's an assembly, a congregation of saints in the heavens. That's why he says, to be held in reverence of all them that are about him. The picture in the Bible is you have God the Father, and then he has this host. It's called a heavenly host. You've heard that expression? A host is a bunch of people. But these are not humans. These are creatures in the spirit world. These are, we, we generally use the term angels. The Bible uses a lot of terms. It'll use the term angel. It'll use the term seraphim, Isaiah 6. It'll use the term cherub. Uh, it'll use the term elders. It'll use the term watchers. It uses the term devil. Now, when you get the word devils, you say, whoa, <laughs> you got the devil with a big D, and then you got the devil with a little D, that all of his minions. The rulers of the darkness of this world. So you have some good Michael and his angels. You have the devil and his angels. My point to you is that all these creatures exist not just on the earth in, among humanity, but there's a host of heavenly creatures out there in the spirit world. Now come with me, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. And Amos, get Colossians 1 in one hand and Amos chapter 9. And remember, just if you will, the very first verse in the Bible. That's not Amos. The first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, what? God created. What did he create? The heaven and the earth. By the way, it's not heavens plural, it's heaven singular. In the beginning, God created two realms in his universe. A lot of verses say he just made everything. That verse starts out, says he made the heaven and the earth. Two realms. The reason for that is Colossians chapter number 1, verse number 16. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth. So you've got some creatures, some position in heaven and in earth. Now when God created all things in heaven and earth, notice what he's talking about in verse 16. Visible and invisible. The visible ones are the things you can see right here. The invisible ones are up there in that spirit where you can't see them. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. All things, all the thrones, dominions, principalities, and power were created by him and for him. Now think about th those terms. Thrones, principalities, powers, dominions. What do those things describe? They describe government. They describe structure. They describe the way things are designed and organized together. Look at Amos chapter number 9. Hold on to Colossians. Amos 9, verse number 5. The Lord God, and that's God. Anytime you see Lord in, in, in first cap, L-O-R-D, and then God in G, capital, G O D in capital letters, the translators are telling you that in the Hebrew text, that is God the Father. That's Adonai Jehovah. Elohim. It's Adonai Jehovah is what the Hebrew is. But that is a consistent way through your Bible. When you see it printed out like that, that's a reference to God the Father. Okay? Now we've talked about that. Get that in Isaiah 48. And the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land, and it shall melt. Notice it's the Lord God of hosts. There's this great congregation that's gathered together with him. And it shall melt, and all that dwell therein shall mourn, and it shall rise up holy like a flood, and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. It is he that buildeth his stories in heaven, in the heaven, and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of, of, the, of the earth, the Lord, Jehovah, is his name. I want you to see that in verse 6. He built his stories in heaven. Now when he says he built his stories in heaven, that's the concept of building. That's not like he told a story. People say, what's your story? 
Tell me about you. That's not, when he said he built, he built his story. It's talking about he, 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 he made a, he, he constructed the heavens with tears, like a structure, with stories. We were at the conference out at Pheasant Run, and my wife and I, we stayed on the third floor of the tower because the kids' work is on the second floor, not where we could walk up and down the stairs and not have to go so far. And that tower has 11 stories to it, 11 floors. Well, when God built his stories in the heaven, what did he do? He built layers of organized governmental structure. Now, what I want you to see about that is that these things are real. They are identifiable. And he uses terms. He says, in heaven, there are principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. He says, on the earth, there are principalities, powers, mights, and dominions. He uses the same terminology to describe both realms. Now, the heavens, you can't see them. They're invisible. You can see them on the earth. So what he's there's two things there for you to get. Number one, I can understand what's going on up there by looking at what's going on down here. Follow that? He uses the, what's here. A principality is the top ruler of a territory. A power. That's like the powers that be ordained of God. That's authority. Um, dominions. That's a territory over which you govern. Um, thrones. Oh, that's government. And it's government over territory. Not just, you know, just willy-nilly stuff. There are nations, there are dominions, there are principalities, there are powers. Ephesians will see a verse in He talks about mites. Think about the structure. You have a top ruler in a territory. That means you have to have a division in a territory. You, didn't we talk about nations? God divided that up. We're going to see some more about that later. So you have a principality with a top ruler. Then you have powers. That's delegated authority. There's a structure of authority and operation. Mites, that's enforcement authority. The difference between a power and a might, one is authority to do something. I give you the right to do it. The other is I give you the ability to do it. You go to the court in our land, you go to a court and a judge says, you can do thus and so. The judge can't do it. He has to get the sheriff to go do it. <laughs> One is the authority to do it. One is the power, the physical might to do it. So you have an enforcement agency. So some of these creatures are ruling and administering. Some have authority to, to dictate the, 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 the things that are right, wrong, that need to be done. Some have the ability to go out and accomplish the things. We'll look at a passage in a minute. Ephesians 1 says, in every name this named. <laughs> That's us down here sweeping the floor, guys. There's this whole, everybody in the heavenly host has a job. All these positions of government, they're separate realms in the heaven and the earth, but the same terms are used to describe both of them because they operate in tandem. And they have a mutual destiny. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I look at you and you look like, whoa, what's going on here this morning? I came to hear about this? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I warned you, we're going, we're going to talk about, and we'll, we'll, in a week or two, when, we, when I'll be able to tie all this stuff together, but you've got to get these things in your mind and in your frame of reference, which means you need to be here every time. And the people that aren't here, the, you know, they're, going to get, they're going to have a hole in their frame of reference. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. I want you to notice... God the Father planned something. He had a will. He purposed in himself to do something. So when God created the heaven and the earth, he already had a plan for the heaven and the earth. What was the plan? What's the destiny? That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, when everything comes to completion that he created time for, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are where? In heaven and in earth, even in him. All what things is he going to gather together in Christ? 
Well, look down at verse number 20. Talking about the exceeding greatness of his power, verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above, there we go, all principality and power and might and dominion and every name this name, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. You see, God's in, God has, the Father has this cosmic plan for His Son to make Jesus Christ the head of all the government, all the workings of the business of heaven and earth. That's why Colossians 1 said they were, all those positions were created by Him and for Him. Amen. They're real, folks. They're not a figment of your imagination. Because God the Father, in His creation, had this great cosmic plan. He put it in two realms, the heaven and the earth. We'll have to talk about why that is, but that's the two realms. And His plan is that His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be exalted and glorified in both of those by having them work together under His headship, that they would be one. That is, that they would work together under one head. <laughs> His, his thinking, His will. So the terms are important so that you understand when you're thinking about this stuff, there's the government, operation, organization, structure, social structure in the earth, but there's also one that corresponds to it in the heaven. And what I want you to see this morning is the fact that in the heavens as well as in the earth, this stuff is organized together in a very special way for a special purpose so that they can be gathered together in one. Now, that's not just talk. There's something that that means in a very special way that you and I are privileged to be a part of. So let's go back and talk about that. Go back to... Well, just look back at Colossians 1 just for a second. Colossians 1, verse number 16. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth. That's the localities. Whether they visible and invisible, whether they be, you got Visible ones, physical, mankind kind of things. Invisible in the spirit world. Now, can I just stop and say, when we talk about the supernatural, the spirit world, there are two reactions that people have. One, the average non-charismatic evangelical says, wait a minute, you know, I'm not really ready for that. And tend, we tend to question it. And rightly so. The charismatic response is, whoo, give me some. And they seek to have it through their emotional experiences. The answer is not to deny it or seek to produce it through your emotional activities. The answer is to go to the Word of God and let God's Word tell you what it is. And the shocking thing for some is that there is spiritual force, there are spiritual forces involved aimed at your life. The disappointing thing for others is that it isn't, it doesn't have to do with your emotions. You don't find it, you don't contact it through your emotions. You contact it through God's Word. Every contact you've ever had with God outside of the pages of that book has been on an inner subjective level. You have no way of knowing whether the God you contacted is the big G of the Bible or the little g of these other guys, except by the objective standard of God's Word. Can you understand why people, these characters, don't want you to have a book you can hold in your hand and say, when that book speaks, it's always right, and when I disagree with it, I'm always wrong? If you don't have that absolute objective standard. God told me one time, so well, God gave me a brain, expect me to use it. Well, we, he, he expects you to believe Him. Not make up your mind what He said. You remember the first time Satan speaks in the Bible? 
What did he say to Eve? God really say that? And when you go out of a meeting and you're wondering, did God really say that? That should tell you something about the spirit that's, that's talking to you. Okay? So the, the fact that there are, and I'm trying to emphasize to you the fact that there are these, these spiritual creatures that are there. And I want you to understand we're not talking about some emotional contact. We're talking about a sp- contact through the Word of God. Jesus said, the word that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That's how you contact God. And that's how you know what spirit you're contacting. Okay? That's why he says this stuff before he says, be filled with the spirit. (laughs) When we talk about that, it's going to be be filled with the, the word of God. That's where it comes from. But you can be deceived in these things. Whether they be thrones, all different kind of, uh, of authorities, whether they be thrones or dominions, these are the ranks, principalities, powers. We read a passage in Ephesians talking about mites and so forth. All these different ranks, these, this authority, these territories, these purposes, these, this division of labor, this tiered authority, the structure, the roles, In other words, there's a hierarchy, not just among the earthly host, but among the heavenly host. And when you think about the spirit war, you need to think about it and understand that there is a dynamic bureaucracy among the angelic creation, just like there is in the earthly creation. Come back with me to the book of Psalms and go back to Psalm 89, where we read just a moment ago. And let me talk with you about that just a minute. Psalm 89. You see how he said there in Psalm 89, verse 6, talking about the congregation. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? There's nobody that compares to God. Now he says to him, he says, I, I, I'm, I'm the Lord. There's none. In Isaiah 45, the Lord in essence says to Israel, Dudes, I've been everywhere. I've looked at the whole creation. There ain't nobody out there like me. He wasn't saying there aren't any other gods, little g. He said, none of them compare to me. I'm the big guy, the top guy. I established the government. But I've got these other angelic hosts. And it's interesting that they're called gods because they're representing him and his government. God... uh, who in heaven is, can, can be compared unto the Lord and to Jehovah? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. So there's a, an assembly of the saints to be revered among all them that are about him, that are about him, and they're called the mighty, the mighty ones. Now look back over at chapter 82, because you've already, if you've read Psalm 89, you've already read about these guys. Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Now that's a, that's a parallel. He stands where? In the congregation of the mighty. He's judging. Why do he stand? To judge Where is he going to judge? Among the gods. See how that works? He's standing in the congregation of the mighty ones. Principalities, powers, mights, dominions. The one to whom who have authority to act in his government. And he's going to judge among the gods. Verse number six. I I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. Notice, he has a congregation, verse number 1, a congregation made up of these angelic creations. And then in verse number 6, he says, You are gods, and all are the, and you are all, are, all of, are, of you are children of the Most High. God has this unseen family in the invisible spirit realm that's organized together for service. 
The angels don't just float around, oh, what we're going to do today. <laughs> they have jobs. There's a service, there, there are assignments that they've been given. They're called gods, and they're called the children of God. Come with me to hold on to that and come on to Job chapter 30, 38. You know this passage. There's more information about creation in Job 38 and 39 than there is in the book of Genesis. People all, you know, the creation scientists people always watch out for science worshiping churchmen. They're as dangerous as atheistic evolutionist. Now, I know I'm not supposed to say that, but that's still a fact. When you go to Genesis 1 to try to figure out creation and you ignore Job 38, you're never going to understand creation. The people that Moses wrote Genesis chapter 1 for already had the book of Job in front of them. They already knew the information in Job 38 and 39 and 40 before they read Genesis 1. So you need to understand there's some things about creation that sometimes people that are always trying to talk about putting the monkey on the run, that is getting rid of evolution, don't know. You know how you get rid of evolution? In the beginning, God created. Those five words. And if those five words won't do it, the person has a spiritual problem that believing in creation won't solve. I know that's not popular. Some of you think I'm nuts, but I'm screwed on the right bolt. <laughs> now, Job 38, verse 4, God talks to Job. Where, where was thou when I had laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? And who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? And who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Who are the morning stars? Stars in your Bible are used as a description of angels. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20, over and over. Morning stars. The morning star. The morning is broken. There's darkness, now there's light. When God brought a in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was that form and, 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 and void and darkness upon the face of the deep. And when God brought light, new life into his creation, the angels were there and they sang together. Now notice also how he describes them. And the sons of God shouted for joy. God's intention has always been to have sons. Keep that in your mind. When I talk to you, we talk to you about the fact that God wants you to be an adult in His family. Paul said you've been predestinated to the adoption of children. Adoption is to be placed in the position of an adult. God wants adults for children. He doesn't want you to be tossed to and fro, carried about by everyone of doctrine. He wants you to grow up into a mature status of being an adult, and a son in the Bible is someone who is fully educated in what his father's doing, understands what his father's doing, and joins his father in it as an equal in understanding. And God has assigned to us that position. He assigned that position to the angels. God has always wanted creatures who could operate his universe the way he intended it to be operated. Now, right there, you ought to go, woohoo! Because <laughs> that's, that's good enough to make even a grace believer want to shout, at least if you understand it. Because God's intention is to have adults in his family. Now, when the Bible uses that term, sons of God, come with me to Luke chapter number three. Here's a verse you're going to need to keep in the back of your mind. Luke 3, when he talks about sons of God, he's talking about someone who is a direct creation of God. Luke chapter 3, talking about the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, verse 38, last verse, Luke 3, 38. Who was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the what? Son of God. What did God create Adam to be? <clears throat> His son. 
He created him to be a fully grown participant in his plan. A son of God is somebody who is a direct creature. By the way, <clears throat> look with me at Psalm 147. Psalm 147, verse 4. He telleth, he counts the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. You remember Jesus asked that guy in, Luke, in Mark chapter 5 that all, all the demons in him, all the devils in him, he said, what is your name? You know why? God, Listen, these characters are real and they are personal and God has given them names. He gives them jobs. Hebrews 1.14, the angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who are heirs of salvation. They have jobs and assignments to go carry out. Now, there are all kind of them. I just want you to see this morning this idea of the family, the house. God has this household, this host in heaven, not just in the earth, among the, we call it angelic creation. And I keep hedging on that because I don't know exactly what to say. Angels are part of the heavenly host. But you have cherubim. You have seraphim. You have watchers. Then you have devils, the bad guys. So you have all kind of creatures in that spiritual realm, in that spirit world. Now those terms describe their jobs, their functions. So you have all these different kind of races of angels, as it were. And then, but they're all, when you're, a, you're in the family, God has this household. Now go back to Psalm 82 and notice how he, how he describes the functioning. Psalm 82, verse 1. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the, uh, among the gods. And if you read verse 2, 3, 4, and 5, you'll see... How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, defend the poor, the father? He described, he's going to indict these gods for not doing the job he gave them, but the job he gave them is to seek just, is to administer his creation the way he designed it to be administered. They have his responsibilities in that. You see, in verse 1, he says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. Does that remind you about a verse? Come back to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Here's a description of where Satan came from. We'll study this passage and, and another passage in some detail next time about where Satan came from. But notice, just notice the terminology here. I'm just, I'm just wanting you to see the structure. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? When God created Lucifer, he created him to be a son. A son of God, a son of the morning. Someone who is going to take the light of God's truth and lead creation in seeing that truth. Lucifer, light bearer. Luke's Pharaoh, light bearer. How art thou cut down to the ground? Uh-oh. Here's an angelic creature that God charged with folly. What was this folly? For thou hast said in thine heart, notice past tense, because in Isaiah 14, this character is fixing to be cast into hell. This is a second advent passage. But he says, here you're going to wind up in hell, but here was what you were trying to do. Here's your original plan. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt what? See, he's got a position of government and rank and authority in God's government. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm going to be above, I'm going to go take the position of above all the angels. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. What is the mount of the congregation? Well, that's what you're reading about in, in, in Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. You remember Job chapter 1? You've wondered what it was. How did Satan get to come into the presence of God back in Job chapter 1 and 2? 
Job chapter 1, verse 6, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And people say, well, how did Satan get up into the third heaven? He didn't. He came to that mount. And remember that mountain concept because this is very important. He came to the mount of the congregation. There's a place in the universe, in the sides of the north, up in the northern regions of the universe, where the host of heaven, charged with the responsibilities of exercising their government, come to give an account of their stewardship. And it's called the mount of the congregation because all the heavenly hosts are congregating there to give account to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came with that crowd. And he came to do what he always does, to be the adversary and the accuser of the brethren. Chapter 2. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the, before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And my point is that there's this, posi- this place where they gather, the gathering together of the rulers and the ruling council, and they have a council meeting, a, a, a rulership. We're going to get together and give account. Now, God rules over everything, visible and invisible. But he, do, he does it through a relationship with intelligent agents, sons. That's the, that's the intent. That's all I want you to see. But there's something about that that's fantastic. He's got this government in the heavens, the government in the earth, and he operates it in conjunction with his people in the heavens and the earth. Now, come with me to Genesis chapter 1. Because although he created the angelic creation first, after the angels were charged with folly, he creates man. Brother Alex says he created a mud man. Do you know you were made out of dirt? You out and get, go out and get some of that Illinois prairie mud on your, on your shoes, that clay on your shoes, and can't get it off. You're just trying to kick yourself off your shoes. <laughs> Why did he do that? Well, the earth is the command center of the universe. The earth is where the throne of God was, is designed to sit. When we study about the Garden of Eden next time, you'll see that the earth is designed to be the seat of God's government in his universe. His city is designed to live here. But because of man's sin, because of sin, it was removed. Man is made out of the earth because that's God's goal. And it's going to be God's instrument to restore his authority, not just in the earth, but through all the heavens. You see, you have to have a command. You have to have a capital. So that's why there's the earth. And then it runs, all the government of the heavens run from there. And we talks about all being one. You have one command center, one brain trust. It runs everything else. Now, Genesis 1, verse 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have, have dominion over the fish of the sea. When God said, let, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. An image is a representation of something. Exodus he says, don't make any graven image. Don't go out here and make a representation of these false gods. You were create, man was created to be in the image, of, we were created to be his representatives in the earth. And when you study that, it's fascinating because God clothed Adam and Eve in a garment of light. No other creature, every other creature that he made, he gave their own, their own clothes. Have you ever noticed that? You're the only, only creature that doesn't have your own clothes. Somebody take a little dog, dress it up in a sweater and all that stuff, put a bow tie on it. But it just don't look right. Because the dog's already got a nice dress. Nice covering, a nice coat, we call it. But you, thank God you've covered it up. (laughs) But that's man. 
When Adam and Eve sinned, they knew they were naked and they were ashamed. Not because they, they, they were ashamed because they lost the covering God gave them. A covering of light. Ezekiel chapter 1 says that God's throw appearance around the throne is appearance of light like a rainbow. They weren't just in a white halo. They were in a coat of many colors. All the refracted colors of the rainbow. That's a dazzling thing. Joseph had the coat of many colors. You remember that? Dolly Parton sang a song about her coat of many colors. Very special, identifying mark. Man walked around in creation as God's representative. He had on a uniform that said, there's my God. Because God himself had that light appearance. So when the Lord Jesus Christ walked with Adam in the cool of the day, the Lord Jesus Christ is in that light. Adam's in the light. All of creation would look and say, hey, there's God's man. He's in God's image. And he had two jobs. One was to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And the other in chapter 2, verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So God gave man two jobs. One, he said, you're to take care of the garden, which was eastward in Eden. And then you're to go out and subdue the earth. So the garden's going to be the, the command center where Adam's going to live. It's going to be his fortress out of which he goes to wage war with a world that's in rebellion. Chapter 3, verse number 5. God doth know, Satan says, that in the days you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and you shall be as what? The gods. They could look out, Eve could look out of that garden and see those gods, those supernatural creatures flying around doing all these wonderful things that she couldn't do. And Satan said, God don't want you to be like that. Your father's trying to keep stuff from you. I got stuff you tantalized her. My point to you is that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Now, when God gave Adam those two responsibilities, look down with me at chapter 2, verse 18. There's something fascinating about how Adam was expected to carry out his job. And I, I want you to get this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 20, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse number 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So there's God's will. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever, whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. God, so Lord Jesus Christ, creates the different animals. Now, he had already created them. They're all over the place. Adam could see them. But Adam wasn't there when God created them. When Adam showed up, they were already there. <laughs> I mean, he's only, Adam's only a day old here. Imagine that. He, I mean, he's a, he's a grown man. He, he, he was... When he woke up, he was already an, an older dude. <laughs> Wasn't like those little babies in the nursery. He was created with, the, with age. But he didn't know all that. So, God, so the Lord Jesus Christ goes out and he creates. The, so that Adam would know those things came because I created them. Now, I created them. What do you name them? The first job that he gave Adam was to use his intellectual skills to interact with creation in such a way as to further develop it. Now listen to me. Adam's functioning involved a genuine, meaningful participation on the part of a son. Remember, Adam is a son of God. He's being educated by the Father into what the Father is doing. 
And Adam is not just instructed, go do it. God says, here's my will. Now, Adam, I've created all these things. Your job is to participate with me in naming them. Use your intellectual, conceptual skills to put into creation something that wasn't there before, a name. That's what he means when he tells he's teaching God to go out and subdue, bring it under control, have dominion. Go out and enhance creation and make it bigger. Take it and make it bigger. You know the illustration I've used with you about peach, about peach cobbler? Peaches are good. Sliced peaches with sugar. My wife had some this past week. Is even better. I get looking like this without work. <laughs> but then when you get the idea, you can take peaches and put sugar on them and put some cream on that. But see, you had the peaches... But now you use your intellectual curiosity and your creative genius to produce some other things beyond that and bring out of them things that God originally put in it. But your participation was necessary to bring it to its fullest. That's how God intended man to operate. But that's how God's intention is to work in his creation all the time. Come with me to 1 Kings chapter 22. This explains a passage that people scratch their head about. That's really a marvelous passage. 1 Timothy, 1 Kings chapter number 22. You and I are designed to have a participatory relationship with our Father. God told Adam what his will was, and he said, that's my will. You go, do, you go get the job done. You use your creative genius to put into effect my will. God didn't have a prearranged life map that Adam had been determined that he had to follow. And if he missed it, he wasn't in. None of that kind of Calvinistic nonsense. That kind of fatalistic nonsense. It's not the God of the Bible. That's, we'll show, I'll show you, that's some of the, these other gods, how they operate out of that insecurity that's in their system. Now, the heavenly host, man, from the very beginning, is designed, God give him his will, here you go apply it, and you go enhance creation. And you participate in the execution, you figure out how to do my will. First Kings chapter 22, God's going to, there's, there's a fight going on here in Israel and Ahab and so forth, and I don't, you don't have to get into all that. But verse number um, 20. Verse number 19. And he said, this is going to be God's prophet. You, you remember the story, Ahab, uh, and uh, uh, they called in Micaiah. And wanted to know, you know, what's God say? And Micaiah was God's man. Ahab had a bunch of false prophets and they were lying to him. And Micaiah comes in and says what God says. And Ahab gets all mad at him. And he says, verse 18, I told you he wouldn't say anything good about me. I told you. I knew it. I knew it. He wouldn't say anything good. So Micaiah says, hear ye therefore, verse 19, the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and watch, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. So he's get, here's, he says, I see God, the Father, sitting on the throne, and he's got all this heavenly host. He's got the congregation with him, all of his judges that go out and execute his, his will. And the Lord said, 20, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead? So God has decided it's time for Ahab to die. So what's the will of God? Ahab, you're dead. But notice what he does. And one's, he says, here's God talking to all of his host. He says, My, it's time for Ahab to die. How are we going to do this? 
And one sat on this manner, another sat on that manner. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord. So we're talking about this counsel in the, in, in the spirit world. And said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he, the Lord said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go get the job done. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. But how did he do it? The Lord didn't say, all right, let's get together, guys. It's time for Ahab to die. Here's what you're going to go do. Now, get this. He said, here's my will. Ahab's going to die. Let's have some ideas how we're going to get that accomplished. And when they came up with an idea, and the Lord said, that'll do it. And they went and did it. And when they went and did it, he said, the Lord did it. What are they doing? They're doing the will of God, but who came up with the idea of how to do it? They say, well, why would God do it? Because God's design and His creation is not for you to be a robot. His design and His creation, His pattern, is that God decrees His will. This is my will. And then He gives a genuine participation on the part of His sons to execute it. You with me with that? That's, that isn't what you hear in religion. But that is what's going on in the Bible. Now go back with me to Ephesians 5, and let me show you this in Ephesians 5. The pattern is that God decrees His will. He states His will. Then He gives His sons the opportunity to participate, genuinely participate, meaningfully participate in the execution of that will. Ephesians 5 verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools. Redeeming the time for the days of evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Why? When you understand what His will is, what do you do with it? You go walk in it. You go apply it to the details of your life. I wish I had the confidence you're getting that the way I'm trying to get it across to you. That is so liberating. That is so different from the shackles of religion and the bondage of the tyranny that the false religious system of these gods seek to put you under. God Himself, He didn't create the angelic creation or man to be rob mindless robots. He created you to be fully informed, fully educated, fully participating sons in the execution of His will, in the details of your life and the responsibilities that you're a part of. That's a high calling, folks. And that's why he says, don't get caught up in all that other stuff. That only brings chaos. Sin brings chaos. We're going to see next time that when the angelic creation fell into sin, it brought nothing but chaos. And they seek to produce it today in the same way, in your life and in our world. And seemingly they're successful, but they're really not because what God's doing is forming a body of believers that are designed to reverse the chaos. Just participate. Understand that when, when, you, when you see in God's Word instructions, He gives you the privilege of being an adult and participating in the execution of His will. He'll tell you all the things that shouldn't be in your life. You know what you do? You get rid of them. And then He says, now put these things into your life. And then He gives you the capacity to use the, cre use the creative genius that He gave you, just like He gave Adam, to get the job done. 
Can I tell you this morning, if you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ personally, you don't have the capacity to do any of this. You don't have the capacity to be fully human. That's why you strive and you, you seek and you push to find an identity, to find validation, to find fulfillment. That's what drives sin. The lust behind sin is a quest for purpose and meaning, validation. You never find it. It's a manic, frantic panic and search that always comes up short. Because you're looking for validation, meaning, and purpose in all the wrong places. In thousands of places that are so small compared to the Lord Jesus Christ that you can't even see them. If you don't understand why God created you, where you came from, where you're going, it's in Christ. If you don't know what mankind's about, it's, it's in Christ. And you can't get there on your own. With your own reasoning, with your own activities. You get there because God gave, you, gave his son at Calvary to pay for everything that's wrong with you. And raised him from the dead to give you his life. The life he intended you to have all along. Gave you the ability to participate in what he's doing. If you've never trusted him. And you thought religion was enough. It's not. If you think that the world is enough. It's not. Only he's enough. You need him. Trust him today. Right where you sit, you don't have to go anywhere, you don't have to move a muscle, you don't have to pray a prayer, you don't have to make a deal with God, you don't have to walk an aisle, you don't have to stop something. Right where you are, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. And when you come trusting Jesus Christ to be the Savior, he died and rose again for you to be, and you trust him alone, God will save you. And you take his life and put it in your life, and that life will be everlasting life then that book will become life to you. And you'll find out what his will, you know what God's will is? That every man be saved come to the knowledge of the truth. <laughs> See, it's not hard. You're saved today. Listen, this stuff's real. You need to take it personally. You need to understand that it, 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 it calls for your, loyal, your believing loyalty. It calls for your faith, trusting in who God really made you. And let that be your life. And wherever you are today, listen, set your affection on things above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Our God and Father, we thank you today for life in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for the high calling that we have in him to be genuine participants with you in executing the plan that you have to exalt your son and demonstrate his value above everything else. In Christ's name we pray.